Now I am most thrilled to welcome members of the Lenape Nation, our speakers tonight, Chief Emeritus Robert Redhawk Ruth, Chief of Education and Language Shelley DePaul, Ceremonial Chief Chuck Gentlemoon, and Storykeeper and Council Member Adam DePaul. So, uh, and you can see here we do have a, looks like a live link in the presentation, but I do also know in the chat that we have the website and I would encourage everyone to check it out. So, oh, one last plug, I'm told. Since we have so many attendees, uh, we would like everyone again to put your questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring. Uh, there's a link in there for you to submit them. So, and we'll monitor those and get to our Q&A at the end. And I'll turn it over to our panelists now. Welcome and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, it's really, it's just wonderful to be back here with you folks. Um, I know my first uh, presentation with the Friends of the Wissahickon was about a year ago. Um, you, you folks have just been amazing with really helping to, to promote and engage our nation, our culture. And I know uh, Shelly and, and Bob have worked with you long before I have. So it's just wonderful that you keep reaching out to us and, and we really always enjoy partnering with you folks. Um, I do want to apologize on behalf of uh, Bob. I do see an email. He's trying to get on, but he's having some technical difficulties. So I'll email him back and um, hopefully he'll be here in a minute. Um, but did one of you two, Chuck Shelley, want to start us off with some words? Open sure. the program. Go ahead, Chuck. Okay. One is. <clears throat> like to do a little bit of an opening prayer for you in Lenape language and um, translate it roughly to English mm -hmm. as, as my uh, teacher is looking on here. Creator. <laughs> 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 Great spirit, great mystery. Use breath we hear in the four winds. We ask you look upon us and smile. Manitowak on se makum starkana. Li win nu lanka main anu. Nu me asho win me no po queen. Si po so king. Ak bayon king. Wule ha king. Spirits all living things around us. What we know and don't know. What we see and don't see. We ask that you look upon us and smile. Onishi. Onishi lekak leleki maiwe. We say thank you for the breath of life and to be able to be here today. We say thank you for all our relations. It is a good day. Aho. All my relations. So if we want to start off, um, I always like to start off with a brief history. It's really... Uh, very amazing often how little people in our area know about the Lenape and uh, if that sounds like you it's not your fault it has a lot to do with with the history of the Lenape here on the east coast um, but I know we want to we really want to focus strongly on our initiatives today what we're doing today and and how everyone can get involved with the nation some of our initiatives so I won't take too long on a history lesson um, but just briefly, so you know about our nation, where we're coming from, the Lenape, of course, are the indigenous people of uh, this area, Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern New York, New Jersey, and Upper Delaware. Um, our nation specifically is the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. Uh, as all of you are aware, uh, I won't go into the details of the history between colonists and Native Americans. I'm sure everybody's aware of that to one aware of that to one extent or another. Uh, but for <clears throat> for all the forced removals, uh, shady land dealings, and other events that pushed the Native Americans and the Lenape uh, out of their homelands, many of the Lenape were removed. Uh, and moved westward, settling a couple states away, you know, before state lines were drawn, settling for months or maybe a year or two, getting uprooted again and pushed further and further westward and northward. 
and those groups uh, ended up eventually after a long trail of of being uprooted and being moved further, ended up sailing, uh, settling in the areas of Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Canada, and thereabout. And oh, I'll pause the history lesson right there to welcome Chief Bob. I think you're muted, Bob. I'm not seeing Bob. Bob just popped up, but he's muted. How am I doing now? Yeah, better. There you are. <laughs> oh, all right. Good to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving a real brief history on, on our nation, and then we're going to kick off with the more interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, so um, many of the Lenape were removed in that way. Uh, and then many of the Lenape, uh, other of the Lenape, were able to stay behind in their eastern woodland homelands. And one of the main, the significant way in which the Lenape were able to stay behind um, in their homelands out here on the East Coast was by, uh, or were by um, colonists taking Lenape women for wives. Uh, Lenape men were not permitted to stay in colonial societies. They were seen as warriors, as a threat. Um, but the colonists were often very fond of marrying Lenape women, as Lenape women worked um, incredibly hard, knew how to work the farm in this, uh, what was then foreign soil to the colonists, and really were, were incredibly um, not just influential, but I would say crucial to the survival of the colonists by sharing their, their knowledge and their skills in that way. So uh, our nation, the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania, as well as the other uh, East Coast nations in New Jersey and Delaware, we represent that lineage of the Lenape uh, people and, and mostly Lenape women who were able to stay here and remain in our homelands by marrying into colonial families and passing on our, our knowledge in secret um, while doing everything they needed to do to pass as, as white enough to not be persecuted in the community. And that's of course, we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers if anyone wants to hear more about that, but that's all the history I'll bore everyone with right now. Um, does anyone else want to talk about what we're doing, the language, our initiatives, anything like that? Well, for the people who are not um, aware, uh, we became partners with the Friends of Wissahickon through our treaty signing. Uh, they've been with us since the very beginning, which was 2002, the first treaty signing. Um, and just to explain a little bit about that for whoever does not know about it, um, back in 2002, we had already begun to partner with some of our friends along the Delaware that were also interested in acting as caretakers, um, um, preservation societies, um, Delaware Highland societies and individuals and groups um, that, whoops, my screen just moved. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm actually, I'm sharing the screen from our website on the River Journey while you're talking so people okay. can see. Um, <laughs> so um, we actually were talking um, about how could we make a more formal partnership with all these friends and um, it, it came to uh, friends of ours, uh, Jim Beer, one of our uh, nation members from way back, uh, that we should just start another treaty. And um, so that's, that's what we did. We came up with a treaty, which any organizations could sign who wanted to serve as caretakers for the Lenape Nation. And um, we started our first one in 2002. We had 19 organizations signed with us and Friends of Wissahickon was were one of our friends. <clears throat> uh, we decided to do redo the treaty every four years. Um, 
because the old treaties, treaties that were signed said that this treaty will stand for as long as the sun shines and the grass grows and uh, we know how all that worked out. So we decided to renew it every four years um, and we have been doing that. And now we are up to, in our last treaty signing, which was 2018, um, we have over 50 organizations, I think close to 70 actually, and over 200 individuals. So it has grown and grown. And these are all people who are interested in supporting the nation, but also in being caretakers. Um, we have, as I said, um, preservation societies, but we've got many denominations of churches that have joined. Uh, different types of individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, Boy Scouts, uh, all sorts of organizations that have formed with us and we've made many, many wonderful friends through the years and it's just been wonderful to see how the, the treaty grows and grows. But Friends of Wissahickon were with us from the very beginning. In fact, Chief Bob and I, oh my, about 10 years ago maybe, uh, we did come to um, the area because they were interested in actually starting a nature trail and identifying some of the native plants in the area. So we spent a day walking some of the trails and, and identifying some of the plants. And then I forget what happened, but for some reason we, we never kind of continued with that. So that might be a nice project for us to take up again in the future. And if I can throw in a shameless plug, while you're talking about the treaty, um, we the tr we signed the treaty as part of the Rising Nation River journey. Um, every four years, we take a river journey. <clears throat> we start up in Hancock, New York, and we paddle uh, down to Cape May, New Jersey. The the first journey, or I believe maybe the first two, that was before my time, I think everyone actually did every inch of the river that first time or two. Um, we do uh, skip one or two lengths there of the more dangerous areas because uh, more and more people have been coming to join us. Um, but we do uh, almost all of the river uh, it takes us about three to three and a half weeks, depending on our scheduling. And on that river trip, we'll make stops along the way to have treaty signings and have presentations with our community partners and other people along the way. So if you're interested um, in becoming a treaty signer, in joining us on the river, uh, one or two days or the whole trip, you can come on and off as you please or uh, getting involved in, in planning or um, just coming to an event, um, please get a hold of us. Um, the next journey will be in 2022. And uh, I have the privilege of being the coordinator this year. So I'm starting, I'm going to be starting planning pretty seriously for that journey this summer. So if you'd like to be involved, um, you can get a hold of the nation and also um, please, uh, Sarah and everyone, feel free to pass out my email if anyone wants to get a hold of me personally. You want me to jump in there anytime? <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Please, uh, I'm, I'm, I have to apologize because um, my granddaughter got married this weekend. And uh, she's got married in uh, Oregon. So I've been traveling around. I just got back today, but I'm so happy to be here. Um, oh, let me get my head right. Okay. Uh, I wanted to say, uh, Ney Deshanzi, Babish Maskinania, Peko Wonkol Nape, Nimonjiai, Millsburg, Delaware. My name is Bob. I'm from, I'm the Turtle Clan Lenape, and I'm living right now in Millsboro, Delaware. But I'm so happy to be here with you all because um, the Wissahickon River is <laughs> my family. Uh, we grew up near there. And I think if we go back to when the first contact made, 
And if you, I don't think there's any, there's a million tribes across this country, across Central America, South America, but no tribe has been identified with rivers as much as our people. If you look back at the early writings of the people who wrote back to Europe, if they came here, they didn't identify us as Lenape or Delaware or Muncie. They identify this as the rivers or streams, we, Stony Creek, the rivers we live near, the Wissahickon Indians, the um, Susquehannock Indians. So it is such an honor to be here today with all of you. So, Anishin. Mm -hmm. Anishin. I'd like to say, Nedashina. Uh, Sakima Toke Kishok. My name is uh, Chino Moon. I am a ceremonial chief of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. I am also a uh, Unami uh, Turtle Clan. I grew up in a little town along the Delaware River, uh, a little bit further north of the Wishahickon, um, up towards Delaware Water Gap. My family, um, our heritage is from both sides of that river both Pennsylvania and New Jersey because before colonization, uh, it was just a river that we could cross. And even after colonization, it's still just a river that we can cross. You know, um, the other, other people put borders and uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily do that. We have more of a territory. Um, I have been honored and blessed to have some really knowledgeable elders and teachers, including Chief Bob Redhawk and Chief Whippoorwill Thompson. And um, I'm glad to be here today, um, especially now at this time, you know, um, I was taught that at, during this time when the leaves start to turn and um, there's certain legends and stories that go with that, that we begin the ceremonial time of our people and it involves 12 nights of um, singing our visions and dancing and uh, it was known in the old days as the game wing or the big house ceremony and uh, even though that ceremony has um, gone away hopefully to come back around someday um, I do my ceremonies for 12 days now um, we started Sunday uh, down in Cape May New Jersey and this will be one of the few times that I'll be able to travel and say that hopefully I can make it from one end of our territory to another before the end of the ceremonies. At least I made it from Cape May back up here to the, the Pocono region so far. So it means I'll just have to take a trip north a little bit here, maybe east. But, um, you know, it, it's important that we remember our, our ceremonies and our language and our culture. And that's part of what we do as um, a tribal organization, as a tribal people. Um, in spite of some of the things that hold it, try, attempt to hold us back, we keep moving forward, just like the turtle. And we keep going forward and making sure that our children and grandchildren know who we are and know who our ancestors were. And that's very important for uh, a community of indigenous people. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> um, and for for those of you who who may be uh, or not not be familiar with terms like uh, Unami and Munsi, uh, the the Lenape had three major clans, and the Munsi or the Mountain People were the northernmost clan of Lenape. They lived in the mountains, southern New York and uh, northeastern Pennsylvania and the Poconos region. The Unami lived below them uh, around the Lehigh Valley area all the way down through Philadelphia. And then we had the Unalaktigo who lived along the coastline. <clears throat> And if you're anywhere in this area, in the ancestral Lenape homelands, uh, you will probably encounter uh, two or three, two or all of those words somewhere or another. You'll see Muncie Trails, you'll see Nami Creek. Um, you might see uh, little alternate spellings, like I see Mincy and Muncie and uh, 
sometimes I've even seen Unam once with the I left off the, the end. Uh, but there are still many place names <clears throat> uh, named after those three clans. Um, and actually, I have a couple questions that uh, that were emailed to me earlier. And uh, Chuck, what you were just saying, I think, touches on one of them. Um, or it was actually that that clan organization. Um, but someone asked, what were the settlement patterns of the Lenape people pre-European times? Uh, this is a question from Stephen. <clears throat> um, so that that knowing that clan organization helps to answer that. Um, but he went on to ask, and I really I don't I'm not sure of this question. Uh, did they migrate from summer fishing grounds or farms? to winter quarters elsewhere? <clears throat> yes. Yes, there was, there was, a, there was um, a travel time for us, especially in the summertime. I know we would go down to um, the ocean area to gather our, our, our uh, fish and, and shells, um, especially for the wampum, for, uh, to get the quahog shells for the wampum. Uh, we would be down towards the ocean more, and then in the uh, winter time, we would come back away from that. And um, I believe uh, Chief Bob could probably correct me if I'm wrong. We'd go back up into the by the rivers and streams, uh, further back inland. But there was always, um, you know, we're the original people uh, for summertime down the shore. I guess you would say. I don't know. <laughs> and we paddled uh, all the way down and dug out canoes. And we yeah. paddled all the way back and dug out canoes. Yeah, yeah I, I would never correct Chief Chuck. Um, <laughs> but, um, no, it, you know, nothing has changed. Even today, we're still, in the summertime, we still go down to the shore, and we still come back to the Poconos in the, when the fall, and the leaves are changing. So nothing's changed there. So, But yeah. no, it, that's exactly what we did. Also, to remember, we also uh, plan it and things so we had our crops we had a plan too but everything was so connected and it was all a big circle the whole uh, uh we, we look at the medicine wheel and the four uh seasons of the medicine wheel and that's really if you think about the lenape and our migrations through to new jersey or back to pennsylvania or in between uh it came with that so it was that's it's all from that and, but nothing has changed today. We're still doing the same thing today. You're still doing the same thing. <laughs> exactly. And uh, one, if I, if I may, one more thing I'd like to add is um, somebody right now might be thinking, well, if you planted, don't you have to stay there and take care of your garden? Well, we had a system for that called the Three Sisters. And with that system, you know, um, we talk about it a lot uh, during the women's ceremonies of corn planting and during our green corn dances that have passed. But basically what it is, is once we plant our main crops, they take care of themselves. So we didn't have to worry about deer or bear or anybody else getting into our gardens. We didn't have fences. Sometimes we had fortified villages, depending on where we were living, but we didn't have fences keeping any animals out because we were all related. We're, we're all one people, whether we're, you know, of the human race or not, we're all part of that universe. So we could leave and leave our garden, wouldn't have to worry about weeding it because the squash are taking care of the ground, the beans are growing up the corn, and the corn's growing and helping all the others. So the three sisters gardens are basically self-sustaining for that. So, and that, that's how we could have a permanent village, but yet be migratory. Well, I guess just to expand a little bit on the history uh, from uh, what Adam was talking about, that many of us came from uh, intermarriages with the colonials. Um, part of the exhibit that we have at our um, cultural center, uh, which was actually an exhibit at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, it was supposed to be for one year and it was extended for three years. Um, some friends of ours from the university uh, had asked us to uh, curate uh, and 
curate an exhibit having to do with just the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania and how we continued to survive. Um, so I guess we should actually tell the story of the fourth crow um, in a shortened version of it. This was sort of a prophecy of our people, um, a story, and it, it said, a fox will be loosed upon the land. The first crow lived in harmony with creator. The second crow got sick and died. The third crow saw what happened to his brother, the second crow, and went into hiding. And the fourth crow came out and lived in harmony with creator again. And I was talking also recently, I mean, previously about the um, 2002 treaty signing and our elders in our tribe, um, and including Chief Bob, seemed to feel that the fourth crow came into being uh, with that first river journey when all of the people gathered around with us. Um, but just to go through it briefly, the first crow lived in harmony with creator. That's when we lived on the planet. Uh, in harmony with all of our relations. <clears throat> and then the second crow basically talks about how we lost our culture, we lost our language, we lost our lives, we lost much of our land. And the third crow is primary history that really has never made it into the history books. And so we're very grateful to the University of Pennsylvania for asking us to come there and tell our story. Um, but during the third crow, as Adam was saying, outwardly, we needed to assimilate. Uh, we weren't allowed to speak our language. We weren't allowed to say our prayers, nothing like that. Um, but we didn't give up on our culture, most of us. Um, some did, some lost the culture. But many of us just passed the culture down secretly. And so the exhibit that we have now shows that third crow and some of the artifacts that we have um, and some of the ways that we did that. Um, one way, um, one of our elders shared a doll, which just looks like a rag doll. But if you pick up the hair in the back, you'll see a face stitched uh, on the back under the hair. And that's to remind her that I'm giving you this teaching, but you keep it to yourself. You show one face to the world and you, sh you keep the other secret. And that's what that doll did. And we had a number of other artifacts too um, that we could pass down. For example, um, our great grant, we believe that when you put a prayer in a rock, which we do often, that, that that rock remembers that prayer and it keeps that prayer and becomes sacred. So some of our elders would simply make a, um, put rocks around their flower garden or even their vegetable garden. But they, this would actually be their prayer circle, but outwardly no one would know that. <clears throat> and so those rocks became sacred because they had the prayers of our ancestors in there and they would be passed down. And one of our elders still has the rocks from her great grandmother that had been passed down and passed down. Uh, we would often have a cedar tree somewhere because cedars are sacred to us. Uh, we would even paint our houses a certain way. The floor would be brown. The walls would be green, the ceiling would be blue. And we even had a stencil, which I don't have here to show you, um, but it would go around your kitchen at eye level when you're sitting. And it just kind of looked like a German stencil, but you could see from the dot, it was a creator's eye and the four directions and a, a dancer or a person. But only the Lenape would have known that. And there were many, many other types of ways that we we kept um, kept our culture alive and passed it down secretly. So that was the third crow. Uh, we had to go into hiding. And the fourth crow is when we come out again and live in harmony with creator and other caretakers. And so basically that's what we're doing uh, with the Rising Nation River Journey and the treaty signing, uh, which we've been doing since 2002. Another thing that we're really excited about, <coughs> excuse me, is that we're bringing our language back. So one of my jobs for the nation is to teach the language, to study the language. And um, 
Uh, so now we've been bringing that back. We have curriculum. We have uh, right now I have two different classes of of, of people uh, taking the language classes on Zoom, and uh, that was one way this terrible pandemic was actually helpful um, because for a long time uh, people couldn't travel to take the classes that I was offering here in the Poconos. We have members that live uh, all over the country really and um, as far away as um, Flemington and up towards Scranton and it was just too hard for them to get to the classes. Um, but since all of this happened I I was taught by some friends how to, uh, and, and Chief Chuck uh, hosts uh, our language classes and now we're able to uh, teach them to so many more people. And I actually have a waiting list of quite a few people if anyone's in, interested mm -hmm. in learning the uh, language. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in the language and I'm sorry to cut you off, but since you're, you're, since you're talking about language, I thought I'd um, jump in. We have, Folks asking um, how similar the language was to other indigenous nations languages, especially well, you, nearby, mm -hmm. and if and when it was written down? No, never written down by us. Okay. It was always an oral language. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, well, first, let me, let me answer your first question. Um, there are different categories of, of languages. The Lenape language is from the Algonquin languages. And we have similarities with Blackfeet or Blackfoot, I forget which one, um, and the Ojibwe and some other tribes. If they are Algonquin, the uh, Mohican, the languages are similar. Uh, but the uh, Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, they're not, they live nearby, but they are not of the Algonquin uh, languages. So their language is very different. The Western tribes, for the most part, are very different. <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> as far as writing it down goes, we're doing that now, but what really happened was that there were linguists who were interested <clears throat> in preserving the language. Some of them just for the purpose of study, but a lot of our language was saved uh, by the missionaries who came because they wanted to convert us to Christianity in, in so trying to do, uh, they translated the Bible <clears throat> and other religious works into Lenape so that we could understand it in our own language. And um, for that reason, a lot of language was preserved. Uh, but no, it's always been an oral language. Our people never wrote it down. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just... <clears throat> No, I'm sorry, I was just clearing my throat. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, would you like me to start peppering the, the group with questions? We've gotten quite a few in, or if anyone was still, I don't want to cut anyone off, but. I'm um, finished. Okay. No, we're good. Gishi. Right. Um, I think we're getting, we have a few questions uh, related to kind of genealogy and how people trace heritage back. Um, and what sort of, uh, what would you look for and, and what resources are out there and what qualifies you to maybe consider yourself as part of, um, of the nation? Ooh, can I jump in on this? Please. Um, this is, um, I teach Native American studies courses at Temple University and this is something that I, I spend almost a whole unit on because uh, the, the, idea itself is is hugely complicated um <clears throat> our nation we have uh what is what you could call a uh, one drop um system or or anything we mm -hmm. anyone in our uh, nation does need to prove their genealogy back to a lenape person um the uh, but as long as that genealogy is is proven, uh, then there's no blood quantum requirement of like 25% or 50% or anything like that. Um, there's a fascinating, for people who are interested in that kind of I idea or especially the, the 
history of that idea in our country. <clears throat> um, if you're not familiar with the one drop racial rule, uh, that's actually a legal document that the American government put out in the times of segregation to um, try to keep as many African Americans out of uh, white spaces as possible. Um, and interestingly enough, they added an amendment to the one drop racial rule, which is called the legal name of, of the amendment and the document and the document is called the Pocahontas exception. That specifically addresses uh, blood quantum as it's uh, as it applies to Native Americans, mm -hmm. just for a little um, trouble, very troubling, but also very um, interesting uh, reading for anyone who's interested in that in that troubling history of, of divvying up blood quantum. I think I think many people are realizing we should be interested in, in understanding these things. So um, we'll be happy to share resources that are mentioned here uh, after the talk with everyone. And to add one, a little bit about the genealogy thing, just a little bit. Um, the one thing that we're finding or we have found over the years as we've been researching genealogy is that Lenape people, Lenape, that once a Lenape family was established, um, the other Lenape families, they all knew who was Lenape. So many of them just stuck together. It wasn't said outwardly. As I said, it had to be assimilated, but they knew, and this comes from one of my female elders who talked a lot about this to me. Um, so the whole idea of blood quantum, what you need to know is that these families knew each other. They were Lenape families and they married into each other. In fact, the elders, uh, this is almost a direct quote from one of my elders said, her grandmother said, you associate with these this family or these children, you don't associate with those. And her, her reason for that was knowing who the Lenape people were. So <clears throat> what we're finding is that if you look and you have one Lenape ancestor, if you look a little closer, you're gonna find, oh, there's one here and there's one here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you talk about blood quantum, I guess you'd trace that back to one ancestor, but, but we don't have just one ancestor. It's like a tapestry of woven different ancestors that come down and uh, from different branches. Um, and that's the case, I've done a lot of genealogical research and that's the case with a lot of our people. They, they knew one ancestor and then as we researched the family, we're finding out, oh gee, this family married in two and this family. So uh, it, it, it becomes a little more complicated than, than trying to find out blood quantum from one ancestor. <clears throat> um, I think I'm getting, I have a category of uh, similar questions, not all exactly the same, but, um, ref but in maybe as a thoughtful extension of this is um, for those of us who are not indigenous, what can we do to honor the nation and be respectful stewards um, of the land? Well, this is the reason that we have the treaty. You know, many of our friends have joined the treaty. Um, <clears throat> you don't even need to know us to be caretakers of the land. Um, that should just be part of your life. But we very much welcome friends, you know, who want to join with us and uh, get on the river. Um, we have people that help us in, in all different kinds of ways. I mean, we have one person that just has a printing shop and he's able to print stuff for us, you know, uh, among our own people. Well, um, my friends, uh, they are members of our tribe, just came and pressure washed my house, down my windows, clean out my gutters. And <laughs> Those I are good friends. It is, but I teach his children <laughs> and I teach him. So uh, yeah. we, we operate as much as possible on the whole bartering system. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got different people that help us out, we help them out. Um, try to stay away from money as much as we can and get back to, you know, money didn't always exist and, and that's kind of how uh, we existed in the past. So now does anyone else want to? If I can add a little bit to that also, um, one of the, one of the things that we've been um, 
doing lately, uh, been asked about lately is um, acknowledgement of um, the ancestral homelands and the caretakers of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have developed a system uh, to help people to show acknowledgement to the land, the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people. But also, um, I want to say that um, one of the main things that we're taught that from our or early stories uh, going back is that when we take something, we give thanks. So one of the most important things is I always tell people, you know, you don't have to be indigenous to say thank you and maybe, um, you know, drop something to the ground. Like when you're, when you're picking your crops, give thanks for that. Um, it, it's real easy to, to be more earth-based and real easy to understand the system of us as people being um, in need of everything else around us. You know, we're the only species that needs everything around us to survive. So in order for that, the, the old ceremonies, the big house ceremonies especially, was a time that was directed for us to be able to give thanks to the universe and take care of the universe because the universe takes care of us. So that's, that's another way of being thankful and uh, taking care of the land in a good way. Oh. Oh. You know, I'll, I'll jump in there too and e echo what Chief Chuck has just said. Uh, when we first, that first treaty, the reason we started the whole treaty and the river journey is because for years, though we kept to ourselves, we were constantly doing ceremony as Chief Chuck does today uh, to, to protect our river. But the problem was, if the people upstream or downstream are throwing things in the river or polluting the river, no matter how many prayers we do at our section, uh, it comes down. So that was the reason we actually started the river journey. We wanted to help people understand our traditional way of protecting our land. Um, we often say that we walk softly upon the earth because you know we don't. Our, our people have been here for tens of thousands of years. You know when we're walking uh, on a trail or by the Wissahickon River, how many of our people are buried there? We don't know. So we always take every step to keep in harmony and to protect that area. But we need, that was the reason I think that we started the river journey. We found that we couldn't do it ourselves. We had to open it up. And that's why it's so important for people like Friends of the Wissahickon, because you guys are doing that. You're actually uh, protecting the river. And let me tell you, the rivers all go out to the ocean and if we don't protect the rivers, we can't protect the ocean, which is most of the world. So I think it's us all working together and keeping uh, our planet in harmony. Oh. Oh. Um, I was trying to organize some of these questions by topic, but now I'm, I may just um, pepper through here. Um, a question I see, does the Pennsylvania portion of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania reflect colonial boundaries? Could you talk about the differences between New Jersey Lenape and Pennsylvania Lenape currently and how that might be different than in a previous period? No, that is, um, that is um, the, the colonized um, version of the United States of America that we, the only reason that we recognize the borders is due to that. And you have to understand the state by state government um, as far as Lenape people go, as Adam touched on earlier, uh, there's only the federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma and Wisconsin, and then there's two groups in Canada. And on the East Coast, either they're in New Jersey, there are recognized mm -hmm. uh, uh, some state recognized tribes, which for a while lost their recognition and then got it back. Um, in Delaware, there's recognized tribes. And in Pennsylvania, we still struggle for our recognition. Uh, we still uh, have to go through the state and um, ask, you know, over and over again that they understand who we are and that they recognize us. There's been roadblocks for us. Um, we're getting ready to try to go back and pursue that again. 
Um, it's very important um, to understand that we hold our traditions and our values very closely um, to our hearts. And, but, but governmental reasons, there's a lot of conflict. And that, that, is, that has to do with the colonization, assimilation, um, removal, um, the genocide that happened. And that's the political part of um, being indigenous. And it's not, it's not the fun part at all. <laughs> I can say that. But it's, it's a necessary part that we have to deal with. I think it's also just worth noting that that of all the states in our area, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania is the only one who has never recognized its indigenous people. Um, so hopefully we're we're trying to correct that. Okay, And it sounds like you're making moves to correct that. And hopefully you'll um, reach out to all of your friends uh, if there's yes. um, friendliness we can offer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Thank you. What is on okay? Wow, we, we have answered a lot of questions. Um, again, kind of bouncing around now on topics. Uh, someone is asking, can you say a bit more about the marriages between the colonists and the women of the tribe in terms of the choices available and treatment of the women? And, uh, well, um, <laughs> my family. I mean. I think each of us should speak because Bob's family came from the Philly area and they have a different little bit history than my family. Um, but many of the people here in the Poconos, the West End of the Poconos, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, descend from German Lenape uh, families. Uh, the German settlers that came here, to make a long story short, uh, were not really interested in politics. They were interested in uh, starting farms of their own. So they moved into the uh, the wilderness at that time, which was the Pocono area. And then many, many more came over um, <clears throat> their relations. And um, so there are, in this area, there's a lot of German Lenape. Uh, in fact, back then, uh, the homes were bilingual. Uh, Lenape and German, they spoke both. Um, so we got along very well with the German people. And um, as far as treatment goes, they, uh, I don't know, my, one of my um, clan mothers actually said to me that they preferred to marry Lenape women because the Lenape women got, got out there in the, in the land and they, they helped to plant and, you know, they, they were very knowledgeable about, you know, all things of the earth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they, you know, they made um, good partners. And um, uh, so that's my, my, uh, sort of the history of, of the German Lenape marriages. Um, Bob could probably talk a little bit more about the Philadelphia area. Yeah, it's very similar um, to what happened up in the Poconos. Um, it, whenever people come, let's face it, even to this day, um, wherever you're living, it doesn't matter what, who you are, what race, people fall in love. And I think that's what happened. Um, there was only so many people here, coming here from uh, Europe. And so, I mean, you know, the, the prospects were slim. So, you know, and some of those winter nights were very cold, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, in my personal, in my family history, it's more of uh, French Canadian. And uh, the trappers that used to come through the area and, um, Right up until my father's time, we, um, we trapped the Delaware River. Uh, we used trap lines and um, we, would, we would hunt and fish every springtime. We would go out and go fishing and it's just part of that history. But that, that was where the, the women married into the French Canadian side of people. So it is a little bit different sometimes with other people. But like Bob said, you know, you can't explain love and you can't explain the, ne the necessities of living. <laughs> and, okay. and making sure that you survive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Adam, did you want to add more or shall I move on to another question? <laughs> um, well, I, I'll, okay. Well, since you ask, I will throw in there. I, I, it's just good to know that, 
the 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 microcosm of the household, uh, the French Canadian Lenape or German Lenape, um, that doesn't necessarily, in fact, it, it doesn't at all reflect the larger governmental society. Um, you know, we we were fortunate to have wonderful relationships, particularly in partic in, in certain communities, um, personal relationships in the household. But outside of that, in in the state or in the colony and the community, um, it, you know, it was not we. There was not a bilingual Pennsylvania. There mm -hmm. was not a colony that spoke Lenape, um, and in society, we had to hide pretty much every aspect. Of, of our Lenape heritage to remain in, to be able to be a part of society without being persecuted. Um, so just good to keep, to keep that in mind as well, I think. Yeah, to uh, uh, jump on what Adam just said, you know, it's funny because uh, when we started the uh, we, the University of Pennsylvania did our exhibit, and the first opening of it, one of my clan mothers um, called me and said, can I bring my grandchildren? She, she was afraid to, because for years she was told not to um, uh, come out, if you will. And so, but I thought, how sad is that? In t uh, 2002, you're afraid to bring your, t your grandchildren to let them know who their heritage is and who they are. And so that's that's really the topics we're really talking about here too. And we, I know personally some some elders that um, in the beginning of our in um, re reformation of the tribal roles, uh, we knew who they were, but they wouldn't uh, accept a, a card or any kind of acknowledgement because they said, if we say who we are, the government will come take everything again. So. Yeah you know there's that part of it too to to be able to to assimilate and hide some of our elders had to do that and they still live with those scars uh, um, i think um that leads us to uh, another theme again um on how to be respectful um i have a question here uh, this again from from someone I in the audience. Um, I often use European names like Philadelphia to say where I'm from, and was struck by how some folks identified their location by, and quote, unceded Cherokee territory. And this was on a recent Zoom call to remind everyone that the Lenape first inhabited this land and that white settlers took this land from them. Would you suggest? quote, unceded Lenape territory or another name to identify location other than Philadelphia? Shaka Maxson. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it really matters that much what people call it. <laughs> I mean, to us, it's our land, it's our homeland. Just as Chuck was saying before, you know, it's a political thing, these boundaries that we have, New Jersey, right. Pennsylvania. We never had that. You know, it was just Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape. Um, and even mm. to this day, uh, we've got the river, we've got all our relations, you know, the winged ones, the creepy crawlers, the sea creatures, all them, all our relations. And so, yeah, you know, we don't think in political terms really when it comes to our land. Okay. Thank you. We, we do get contacted by many people asking about things like land acknowledgements and, and how to make that gesture. Um, and it's, you know, anytime people want to do that, it's just a wonderful initiative to know people are, are recognizing the history and, and know that we're here. Um, and even then, there's, there's no particular keyword or quote that, that we ask people that people use, but the one thing I'll put out there is, if you're going to do something like that, give a give some kind of land acknowledgement to let people know that you recognize that the Lenape were here. Um, you do use some kind of language um, like the ancestral lands of the the ancestral homeland of the Lenape or the the unceded territory. What you said is fine, um, but just avoid things like this. This was the Lenape's land or something that suggests that we saw this land as, as a possession of ours, mm. as something we owned. Um, 
that that's a it's it's a small thing, but it's important distinction, and and we did not think of this as right. our possession, so we try to encourage people not to use that type type of wording. Thank you. Sure. I think that's um, very. I think that means a lot to people to to make that distinction, and and to so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I have another question again on this idea of um, how to be respectful and, and acknowledge and, and also talk about history. And now I've, I've lost the question, so bear with me. Here is, um, oh well, there's a lot more questions, um, but I'm back up at the top. And this is from an education standpoint. What are your thoughts on educators sharing the Earth on Turtles back creation story? I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I'm someone who's very into mythology. That's kind of my, my academic area and my personal hobby. And I, I think it's one of the best ways to communicate a, a people's culture is through their stories. Um, the only thing I'd say is, is make sure you're getting that story from a reputable source. Um, because, you know, traditional stories do, they, they really help you immensely get at, get at the heart of our people. And a lot of our stories really encapsulate the, the spirit of the Lenape people. Um, but uh, you can't just Google search something and, and pull the thing, first thing you find on Wikipedia, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the versions that you find of our stories, creation story and everything else have been filtered or recorded by different folks mm -hmm. for different reasons. Um, so just make sure it's coming from a reputable source. Again, always feel free to reach out to the nation to ask where the best sources are for that kind of stuff. But as long as it's genuine, I, I think it's a wonderful way to teach. Excellent. Well, I see that we're at seven and I'd like to turn it back over to the panel if you have any final thoughts. I think that we have, judging from the questions, we've got material for hopefully future conversations and maybe on uh, targeted topics. It seems like language is, uh, you know, learning more about the language is, is very popular. Um, and just, uh, I think we could do a deep dive in any number of these areas. So I hope that we can have a, a future series, but for the last few minutes, I'd love to turn that back over to the panel for any final thoughts or um, questions back or reflections. I don't know. <laughs> Well, personally, I'll say I'm, I'm really looking forward to to doing more. If, if there's more we can do, I'm really happy to know people are so interested. Um, I'll say really briefly, we talked about um, the, the prophecy of the fourth crow. We talked about the different times and how now we consider ourselves in the fourth crow, uh, in that era where we can finally really come out and, and not only recognize, but promote um, publicly uh, our culture and the fact that we're still here. And uh, in my opinion, one of the, the strongest elements that have helped usher in this time of the fourth crow is um, exactly uh, things like this. Um, people, especially our community partners, especially our treaty signers, uh, bringing us to, to offer this kind of information and to, to meet new people and make new partnerships with people who are interested in learning more about us. Um, and Chuck, you always uh, end, or, or very often you end ceremonies in a, in a wonderful way. And I can't remember the exact words you use, but you talk about bringing what you learn here today forward. Um, yes. And I think that really encapsulates the, the fourth crow what we're doing here today. Do you want to mention that? Sure. Um, I was always told that, um, and this comes from the elders, that uh, everything begins and ends with creator. Um, one of the misnomers that was approached in early settlements is that we worshipped everything. We didn't worship everything per se. We gave thanks to everything. But there's one creator, we call him Keshela Mukong, Keshela Mink, he's the Manitou. There's different names for him. But basically it means great spirit and great mystery. 
And in our creation story, it talks in all our creation stories, it talks about how creator became creator through his vision and through his dream. So when we come together for these moments, we have to remember that as, as part of humankind and part of all our relations, we are standing here now as part of creator's dream. So when we take this forward, we should always take it forward in a good way so that his dream can be continued on for the next generations down the road. I just like to say that um, <clears throat> revitalizing the language is my heart and soul and my life's work. Uh, I'm so touched that you mentioned that so many people were interested in the language. So um, I will be holding courses and keeping a waiting list. And if anyone is interested in taking a course in the language, um, I guess they could uh, email our website, right, Adam? Is there a link on our website? Mm -hmm. We have an email. Yep, our, our email is there and they can also message us at the bottom of the page. On the website and, you know, I'll get you on a waiting list if you'd like to uh, uh, learn the language. Our language is extremely endangered, extremely endangered. Um, so everyone who learns it is a big help in helping to revitalize. So that's I think you're, I think you're going to get a lot of emails. Okay. <laughs> that's good. That's good. And I, I, I just like to thank everybody for inviting us here. But um, really, I think for us too, it's like if you want, once things change a little bit, please come to our uh, powwows, uh, talk to us, come to our uh, cultural center. Uh, we're all, I think we all, all of us here, we're all one people. There's no separation between us, the earth, or each other. And that we, we have different cultures. We really are all one people. And I think our main job here is to be caretakers, not only of our land, but of each other. And um, I think what you, you all are doing, you should be commended. And uh, you're really walking the Lenape way when you take care of your rivers here. So thank you and Wanishi for having us here. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to say thank you again to our panelists and to everyone who was on tonight. And uh, we'll be following up with uh, more information and we may try to answer more questions that came in later in the um, talk, perhaps in our newsletter or, or in additional um, talks in the future. So everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Oh, the thing now. Ah, uh, Papich Kinewa. Papich Kinewa.